You're watching DW News uh, live from Berlin. Uh, a special extended uh, program because the uh, Turkish uh, president, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is uh, here in Berlin. Uh, you'll see now on your screen, uh, there is his host, German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, waiting to uh, meet the car. And we arrive just in time to see the Turkish president uh, arrive at the Chancellery. Political correspondent uh, Simon Young is uh, here with me. Uh, and much, um, there's, there is much riding on this uh, meeting for both sides, Simon. Absolutely. There's a lot for these two leaders to discuss. And you can see uh, Chancellor Schultz uh, smiling a little bit there. That's a bit of a contrast to the scene we saw briefly earlier when President Erdogan arrived uh, at the German President Frank Walter Steinmeier's residence. Uh, the German president had a very, very sort of stern expression on his face and, uh, you know, you had to say didn't seem to be uh, sending out a, a particular message of friendly welcome. Uh, Olaf Scholz uh, has uh, taken a slightly different uh, approach there, at least for the cameras. But uh, as to what they have to talk about, well, we've already mentioned uh, these big differences over uh, the uh, war between Israel and Hamas and the tone, the incendiary tone that President Erdogan has adopted and uh, Germany's desire and the expectation that of many have here that he will push back against uh, those kind of comments. But there are also plenty of issues uh, for instance, on uh, weapons, the uh, Turks are keen to uh, get hold of the Eurofighter fighter jet, uh, and that's something that we think may well be on the agenda between these two leaders. Uh, they want to talk about migration, they may talk about the war in Ukraine, they may talk about that old chestnut of Turkey's application to become a member of the EU uh, eventually, although no one thinks that that's likely to happen anytime soon. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Turkey is also hoping to get concessions finally from Germany over visa freedoms for Turkish citizens to travel more easily. They would also like uh, uh, the customs union to be extended. There is, there is plenty of issues for these two it's allies and partners to talk uh, but about. But what does Germany want uh, from Turkey? Well, I think Germany would like uh, a couple of things specifically uh, in relation to migration. They would like to reactivate that uh, migration deal that was done back in 2016 between the EU and Turkey, which is holding back uh, quite significant numbers of people who, who might seek to mig migrate here uh, uh, at the moment in, in Turkey. Uh, and another thing that might be uh, important between the two leaders is the topic of NATO accession for Sweden. That too is blocked at the moment in Turkey. Uh, the Turkish parliament has to ratify a NATO accession for Sweden. Uh, and uh, they've only just begun to do that rather belatedly. Uh, the President Erdogan himself has, seems to have removed his objections to that now. So it is beginning to go, to go ahead. Uh, but uh, I think Germany would also like to be arguing, uh, you know, to, to make sure that that does go through. Of course, in the context of the Ukraine war, uh, there's a great desire that uh, these two new members, Finland and, and Sweden, which is being blocked, uh, uh, might uh, might join and bolster NATO at this time. I'm intrigued by one of the, the well, any number of the points that, that you raised, but the, the one that hasn't had much publicity is this: these Eurofighter um, uh, uh, jets. Turkey wants, I think, 40 uh, of them. Germany is one of the manufacturers, one of the co-manufacturers, and Germany has been opposing um, uh, Turkey's purchase of these jets. Why? Well, uh, this sale would require. Uh, the support of Germany because Germany is part of the consortium that builds this uh, plane, although they're actually mainly manufactured uh, in Britain. Uh, Turkey wants to sort of beef up its air force, uh, get more modern equipment. It wanted the, the US F-35 planes, but uh, they won't get those because uh, the, the US have said uh, no, partly because Turkey's also bought um, the S-400 uh, missile system from Russia, so they, so they don't like that. So uh, this deal uh, for 40 Eurofighter uh, Typhoon jets uh, that Turkey's hoping to put through uh, is, has more emphasis on it now. The Turkish Defence Minister said yesterday they've got the agreement from uh, Britain and Spain, which are the two other countries involved, but Germany has a particularly strong line uh, on not giving 
uh, weapons, not selling weapons to countries that are involved uh, in conflicts uh, and countries where there are question marks about democracy, human rights and the rule of law. That is the case, the latter is the case uh, with respect to Turkey, uh, at least as uh, it's seen here in Germany. Uh, and uh, for that reason, um, you know, Germany's wavering, particularly this government, I should say, with its, um, with its Social Democrats and Greens in it, they've got that particular sort of red line in their manifestos, we don't, uh, we don't to sell weapons to the problematic countries. And, and, and despite being a NATO member, Turkey is regarded as uh, problematic. Um, Simon Young is uh, DW's um, uh, political correspondent. Um, you're watching a specially extended uh, program. As we wait for the uh, Turkish president, Recep Tayyip... Uh, oh, that's a good photo, isn't it? Uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan, who is meeting with the German uh, chancellor. Uh, just uh, arriving now at the lectern in the chancellery, so let's hear what's being said. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome the Turkish president here in Berlin. It is good, Mr. President, that we will have the opportunity to speak face to face because both of us are very much concerned with the crises in this world. First, the Russian attack on Ukraine and the impacts that has have, had, that has made the entire world suffer. Both of us agree that Russia must cease its aggression as soon as possible. Turkey has played a constructive and an important role when it comes to getting Ukrainian grain to the rest of the world despite the battles. And I would like to thank the Turkish president for his personal commitment in this very important issue. It is bitter that Moscow has not continued this agreement. Russia, with its war of aggression, is turning international law on its head. The borders cannot be pushed to one side. I have called this a turning point in history. And in a moment, we'll be talking about where we are with Sweden acceding to NATO. The Turkish parliament is debating this, and we hope that we will get a green light from this because we want to strengthen NATO as an alliance. A further very important issue is, of course, the situation in the Middle East. On the 7th of October, Hamas attacked Israel in a most barbaric manner. The German government condemns in the strongest possible terms this terrorist attack of Hamas. We will also be talking about how we can prevent a further escalation in the region because we are all very much concerned about the violence spreading in the Middle East. If you know Germany, you will know that our solidarity with Israel is unwavering. Israel has the right to defend itself aligned with international law. At the same time, we say every life is equally valuable, and this means that the suffering of the people of Gaza, the Gaza civilians is suffering us, is upsetting us as well. For decades now, Germany has been giving humanitarian aid to Gaza. It, we have currently upped this sum to 160 million euros, making us among the most generous donors of humanitarian aid. The current conflict makes us look at the necessity to find a long-term solution to the conflict in the Middle East. We continue to advocate a two-state solution. Allow me to say in no uncertain terms that Israel's right to exist is inviolable. And allow me also to say that there is no place for anti-Semitism in our country, be it politically motivated, religiously motivated, whether it comes from the far right or from the left, whether it has grown here for centuries or arrived here new into the country. And at the same time, I would like to counter all of those who are not allowing the five million Muslims living in this country 
their place here. I am also against that very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East for a long time has been a region fraught with conflict. And because it is a neighboring, con a neighboring region, is we cannot remain indifferent at what's happening there. President, I am aware that we have different, indeed very different views on this conflict. That's hardly a secret. And that is even more a reason for us to talk, particularly in difficult times. We need to speak directly face to face. Above and beyond this, these acute international issues, we will be talking about how we can make progress in our bilateral relationship and in terms of the relationship between Turkey and the EU. In recent years, the relations between the EU and Turkey have been behind what we could be, behind the potential that we have. I will be talking with President Erdogan about how we can make progress here. People fleeing their homes and irregular migration are an important issue for us. We both want to contain irregular migration. In 2016, the EU and Turkey concluded an agreement I believe is a good one. In the European Union, I continue to advocate a continuation of this agreement. It is of benefit to both sides. And with reference to the question of reformment, we will have to speak as well. The citizens of Turkey and of the EU have many ties. It is important for me that the contact between our peoples remains as easy as possible. And this is something we will also be discussing. The earthquake in Gaziantep region showed us that our countries feel particularly close. Germany sent rescue teams immediately, sent all kinds of health care support as well, and a great deal of money. We provided money as well for the rebuilding measures, and we'll continue to do so. A real potential is also there when it comes to economic cooperation. Mutual trade is something we want to expand. The legal certainty for companies and a stable economy are an important basis for this. So you see, there's plenty to talk about this evening. Thank you very much. Sayın Şansölye, kıymetli heyet üyeleri, saygıdeğer basın mensupları, Member. It is an honor to be here. I would also like to thank German President Steinmeier and Chancellor Scholz for the hospitality they are showing me today. This visit, following an invitation of Mr. Scholz, is one that is very important for me, not least within the framework of our bilateral relationships, although there are many different dimensions to these relations. There is an economic component, a military component, but also the developments of the Russian war against Ukraine, I'm sure we were talking about, as well as the events and developments between Israel and Palestine. Let me speak in no uncertain terms here. Quite frankly, the 7th of October is often depicted as if it were the beginning of these events. But we're talking about 13,000 women, children, old people, 
and men who have been killed since then. In fact, there's almost nothing left that we could actually call Gaza because it has been essentially razed to the ground. We hear about Hamas from morning till night and they are attributed a great deal of power. But can we compare the power of Hamas to the power that Israel has? Is, does Israel have a nuclear weapon? Yes. But if you ask Israel, it will not say yes to that question because it may not wish to tell the truth in that regard. We hear that Israel is getting financial support, but we never hear that Israel is passing on the support that Palestine should be receiving. There's money donated that they're not getting. We are seeing houses of worship being bombed churches being bombed in Gaza, even hospitals being attacked, even though the bombing of hospitals and the killing of children does not exist in the Torah. This is not allowed in the Torah, nor is it allowed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And yet these children are being killed. They are even being killed in hospitals. And are we going to remain silent in the face of this? Are we not going to raise our voices against this? And if we do not raise our voices against this, if we do nothing, how will we pay the price when we look back at history? And the psychology of guilt is not the right approach to this. We are not guilty towards Israel. If this were the case, perhaps we wouldn't be able to speak as clearly as we can either. But it is also the case that we have not gone through the experience of the Holocaust. It is important to respect people. And when I was Prime Minister, I was very clear when there were cases of anti-Semitism. At that time, I spoke out clearly against anti-Semitism. We therefore have no guilt towards anyone. Now, on the occasion of this visit, we will naturally be discussing these things. But there's another important point that we have to talk about as well. Namely, how can we solve this problem? A humanitarian pause in fighting. And how can Turkey, how can Germany contribute to achieving this? How can we take these steps together? That's important as well. And the question of whether we're prepared to do this or not. German President Frank Walter Steinmeier, when he goes to Israel, I have said, listen to both sides. Let us both listen to each other as well, and let us try to achieve this humanitarian break in fighting. And if we can achieve this humanitarian ceasefire as Turkey and as Germany, and if we can achieve that, then we would be able to liberate this area from this constant crossfire that they are caught in. Naturally, we are also prepared to help when it comes to liberating the hostages. But what about the number of hostages, the Palestinian hostages in Israel? 
What about the number of Palestinian hostages? So when we use the word hostages, we have to be aware of that. And there are many more times the number of Palestinian hostages in Israel. They are imprisoned in Israel at the moment, and we have to see this as well, because if we don't, that is simply not fair. We are willing to help where we can, just as in the Black Sea, we negotiated to achieve a corridor for grain to pass from Ukraine. The same is true as we try to help this grain get to Africa. The same is true in this case. And a grain corridor from the Black Sea to Africa, I would say 50% or 40% came to Europe, 40% to Africa, and the rest went elsewhere. And at the moment, from Africa, there are requests once again for this, and Russia has a great deal of grain that it is going to be sent into Africa again. But there are many problems. I think. Zimbabwe is one of the areas. Grain is being sent to Zimbabwe, but it has to be ground into flour. And the facilities that they need for that are not present at the moment. And I have offered us Turkey to grind the grain into flour. We will send this grain to our flour factories and then pass it on to this country or to other countries as well. These are the steps that we need to take, and we will do so. There are four or five different countries, I believe, where Russia is prepared and planning to send grain to these countries. And in the second step, i.e. the processing of the grain into flour, as soon as we can, just as soon as Russia has taken the necessary steps here. We will do this. To ensure that all of these steps can be taken, there needs to be a step between Turkey and Germany and our German ally Germany our NATO ally Germany, sorry, naturally needs to take resolute steps to make progress if we are talking about the export of certain arms goods because we want to work even more closely together with Germany in this area and if we hear that 3.5 million people make up the Turkish community in Germany, then we can build an important bridge to Turkey. We need to serve the religious needs of this community and are working together to train the people required. A further point we will be talking about is Immigration. We have a working group that is established to discuss the question of migration. Then there's the question of Turkey's accession to the EU in the future, an important thing that we want to talk about as well. And naturally, we very much hope that this accession process will continue, that the Customs Union will be modernized, but also the matter of visa liberalization. We have certain expectations in this regard as well. One of the engines driving the EU, Germany, and Germany's support in this question is very important. And for 25, for 52 years, rather, we have been trying to have closer ties to Europe, and we would like to see 
visa liberalization accelerated as a process, and we will try to discuss this issue as well. Representatives of the press, what is going on in Gaza will naturally be something we will be debating particularly intensely, but as Turkey, right from the very beginning, we have been against attacks on civilians and will continue to be against this and have raised this question wherever we can. And the first priority needs to be a ceasefire. And we need to ensure that aid can reach all of those who are in need of it. We we have sent 250 tons of aid first to Egypt, and then more recently we have sent 666 tons of aid by ship. This is primarily food, etc., and then medical support as well. But the problem is that we must stop the blood show. 27 patients with serious cancer have been relocated to Turkey from Gaza. I visited them yesterday in hospital and asked them how they were doing. And I very much hope that we can receive more patients, cancer patients, but also wounded civilians and nurse them back to health or take care of them as best we can in Turkey. Naturally, a two-state solution based on the borders of 1967 is what we need. That's what we believe. As Turkey, we would like to create an atmosphere in which Israelis and Palestinians can live side by side in peace and in security with one another. We must make this happen. Naturally, we all need to do a great deal to create a conducive environment for this kind of peace. Let me conclude by thanking you once again for your hospitality and thank you for the fact that our visit is understood as important as it is for the region and for all of us. Thank you very much. News. Uh, this is the uh, press conference the Turkish president and the German chancellor. I have a question to Chancellor Scholz. Though, obviously, if the president wishes to say something, that is fine. Now, Turkey cannot be indifferent to the situation in Gaza and has rescued patients and taken them to Turkey, but as a broker, we have heard that Turkey would like to try to broker a peace solution, and the evacuation of people from this region is something they support. Now, Germany and the EU, my question is, what do you want to do when it comes to the evacuation of patients and ill people? Can we come up with some kind of joint mechanism to try and rescue some of these people? What does Germany say to that? Israel is killing a child every 10 minutes in Gaza, and this is an outrage for humanity. And do you believe that Israel needs to be taken to court before the International Tribunal also, for Human Rights? Ein paar kurze from well, Seite first aus. of all, let Zunächst me just make a couple of statements here. Statement As I've already said in my introductory Israel statement, Israel has the right to defend itself. It was a brutal, atrocious attack that Hamas, Hamas unleashed on children, on women, on old people. 
And And we saw that there were young people celebrating this in Gaza. And Israel cannot risk further missiles being shot at Israel from Gaza. And this is what Israel's right to self defense entails. At the same time, every opportunity must be used to reduce the number of civilian casualties and to ensure that this is considered with every step. For us, it's very important that we push for what is necessary here. This regards humanitarian aid that we want to reach Gaza. We began with this very early on. We ensured that this can be successful, and we continue to pursue this end. As you know, Germany is a country that is in the forefront when it's about providing this humanitarian aid, not just now, before that as well, because the civilian population in Gaza is a hostage of Hamas, and Hamas is using the civilian population there as human shields. We are pushing for sick people to be able to be treated in the region, and we are happy to support this to a larger extent. It is the case that we definitely want to push for those who have another citizenship be able to leave Gaza as well, and we are trying to ensure that everything is done, that the hostages taken by Hamas be released without any conditions, and we are speaking with the Turkish government on this front as well as with other governments, with the Qatar government, the Egyptian president, and many others as well, because there has to be a common exertion of influence to try to ensure that these hostages are released by Hamas. And to make this possible, we agreed in the European Council that we want there to be humanitarian pauses in fighting so that hostages can be released, so that foreign nationals can leave Gaza, so that humanitarian aid can reach those in need in Gaza. But this doesn't change the fact that there is a need for Israel to have to be able to defend itself and for this not to be questioned. Thank you, Michael Fischer, DPA, President Erdogan, in recent weeks, or in the the weeks after the Hamas's attack on Israel, you have caused a certain amount of outrage with some of your comments, not just here in Germany, but among some of your NATO partners. I would like to ask once again how you meant these statements. For example, I'd like to know whether or not you are committed to Israel's right to exist, which is a reason of state here in Germany. And I'd like to know what you mean when you accuse Israel of fascism and when you call the Israeli military operation against Hamas genocide. How do you justify that? And how do you justify calling Hamas a liberation organization which has murdered hundreds of people in Israel and which is considered a terrorist organization by all of your NATO partners and chancellor? You have described some of Mr. Erdogan's comments with reference to Israel as being absurd. Are they merely absurd, or do they threaten German-Turkey relations and Turkey's role in NATO? And what does this mean when it comes to the export of armaments? We just heard that the Turkish president doesn't want to have any limitations on exports. Turkey would like to have 40 euro fighters and is germany going to approve that under these conditions öncelikle nato'nun önde gelen ülkelerinden bir tanesi Well, first of all, let me say that one of the most important NATO partners is Turkey. We're in the top 5. And You can't just have, you know, we're not just any old country in NATO. We are among the top five important ones. And whatever your views happen to be as a country in NATO, that doesn't matter. Between Russia and Ukraine, we 
who is on the side of Ukraine, everyone. But we, as Turkey, speak with Ukraine and we speak to Russia too. And we do not differentiate between these countries, but 330 million tons of grain through a grain corridor went to Europe, went to Africa because of our negotiations. That was our country. And thousands of Palestinians have been killed by Israel. The hospitals have been wiped out. The mosques, the churches were bombed. As a Muslim, I have a problem with that. As a Christian, don't you have a problem with the fact that these churches are being bombed? And why is there no response to this? I think there should be a response to this. In this connection, in the region, when we are talking about Jewish, Christian, Muslim people, we do not distinguish, we do not differentiate, and there shouldn't, we shouldn't differentiate. I have always been against an attitude that people are anti-Semitic. But, for example, you are talking about the support that Germany is giving, or you're talking about Eurofighters, whether or not Germany approves the export transaction or not. There are plenty of countries involved in fighter jets, making fighter jets. We can get them from other countries as well. And then thrones, drones, for example. I mean, Turkey is actually very ahead of the game when it comes to drones manufacturing. I think you should ask questions that are human and that show you have a conscience so that we can actually answer questions, not questions like that. First of all, I would like to emphasize what I've already said, the role of Turkey. Watching uh, the press uh, conference, a pre-press conference uh, between the uh, Turkish president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's here in Berlin, uh, between him and uh, German Chancellor uh, Olaf Scholz. So they're holding this press conference ahead of their uh, meeting. Uh, translation uh, during that was by uh, Catherine Jones. Uh, here with me uh, in the studio is DW uh, political correspondent uh, Simon Young. Uh, quite a lot to get through uh, there, Simon. Six minutes from Schultz, I made it. 14 minutes from Erdogan. Uh, what stood out for you? Well, I think uh, they both, both leaders went down the list of uh, possible talking points that uh, we outlined a bit earlier, you know, in particular the Middle East, uh, Israel, uh, Gaza. Uh, they both acknowledge that that is going to be at the, at the central focus, but they also touched on these other things like migration uh, and arms deals and uh, NATO membership for Sweden and so on and so on. Um, I thought interesting from uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz was that he, he started started off by saying, you know, thanking uh, President Erdogan for the constructive role and important role that he'd said in his personal commitment to helping in the Ukraine-Russia conflict. He didn't talk about uh, uh, the Middle East until, uh, you know, point three of his list. But when he did, he, he, he did also uh, focus in, uh, in particular, I think, on sending a message uh, to uh, Muslims, both people in Turkey, but also people here in Germany. He talked. Uh, uh, he talked not just about the suffering of Israelis, as has been much focused on in recent weeks, but he's also said, uh, you know, the suffering of Gazan civilians is also upsetting. Uh, he wanted to emphasise that, and uh, and that there must be a place for. Uh, Muslims in Germany, he said, speaking out against Islamophobia. So I think those are the kind of remarks, evidently, that President Erdogan standing next to him can, um, you know, agree with. And when it comes to President Erdogan himself, he, uh, for his part, didn't really express an outrage about the 7th of October attacks by Hamas. He went straight in uh, talking about uh, 
uh, you know, the suffering of people uh, in Gaza uh, that he said, but I think his tone was largely conciliatory. He, he, what he was really focusing on was saying we must have a humanitarian pause in the fighting uh, and get aid through to uh, civilians there. He, he made that point repeat. a number of times, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He kept saying it. Uh, and he wants Germany's help, indeed, to, uh, you know, get some international uh, focus on that or more international focus. Um, what he didn't do was repeat these sort of inflammatory remarks uh, and say anything like, you know, Hamas is freedom fighters or Israel is a terrorist state. Even though he was asked about those uh, in inflammatory uh, remarks, although... I did. You, you talk about the conciliatory nature of, of 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 his remarks. Did I detect criticism of Germany when he he talked about when um, President Erdogan said we are not guilty of acting against Israel? Maybe if we had been, we'd also have difficulty speaking directly. Well, of course. Uh, and he then immediately went on to say that we you know we we uh, have um, not gone through a Holocaust. Uh, as the, uh, the the Jewish people uh, did, and of course the, the Holocaust is one of the key uh, sort of contexts of uh, the conflict between uh, Israel and the Palestinians, and the and the uh, the situation in the Middle East uh, more widely. So, uh, no, I mean, I think he he was conciliatory. He talked about how, as minister, uh, some years ago now, he he spoke out against anti-Semitism uh, in his country. Uh, and he s sort of was saying, you know, I want to broker, uh, together with Germany and other countries, I want to broker a deal uh, because I see myself as a, you know, as a voice that can sort of talk, talk to, both to both sides. sides. Yeah. This is talking to the both sides, as he did in, in the Russia-Ukraine situation, uh, which he says brought about the grain deal that has brought uh, food to, to many people, particularly in Africa. OK. Uh, and... And so, um, thank you for that, uh, Fanon. Uh, Simon Young, a DW uh, political correspondent. Uh, let's get more on this meeting of the uh, Turkish president with uh, the German chancellor uh, from uh, Julia Hahn, who is uh, standing by for us in uh, Istanbul, uh, listening in to that. Uh, welcome, uh, Julia. Uh, so, um, standout points for you. Well, listening to the Turkish president there, I think he has been, by his standards, rather restrained in his criticism of Israel. I agree with what Simon said. Um, he came across as conciliatory, um, very different from what we've heard from him and seen from him here in Turkey in recent weeks. Just a few days ago, he uh, called Israel, and I quote him, a terrorist state that is committing war crimes with full backing from the West. He has repeated repeatedly praised Hamas as liberation fighters, knowing that most of his Western allies, including Germany, classify them as a terrorist organization. Nothing like that today. No verbal attacks, even though he was specifically being asked about his criticism by a German uh, journalist. Um, what does this tell me? I think uh, he might have had some good reasons to t tone down today. And I think he is uh, balancing between different audiences here, the foreign audience in Germany and the domestic one because at home here in Turkey he needs to appease his Islamic conservative political base which has strong pro-Palestinian sympathy sympathies um, I'm not saying and I don't think that uh, most of the Turks here in the country agree with his pro Hamas stance but public anger here in Turkey has been uh, growing amid the rising death toll among Palestinian civilians uh, President Erdogan is very well aware of that and he's been using that for political purposes for example for uh, distracting from other pressing issues here in Turkey the broken economy for example but uh, a very a different add-on with a very different uh, rather soft message for his standards as I as I said uh, in Germany tonight and his uh, urgent and persistent calls for a, a ceasefire in the uh, Israel-Hamas uh, conflict and positioning himself uh, very much as a, a potential mediator. Well, yes, he uh, spent uh, uh, quite some time, of course, talking about uh, the dire humanitarian situation in Gaza, about the, the death toll there among men, women, uh, children. Um, he, he said uh, the Israeli attacks on Gaza need to stop. He has repeated his calls for uh, a humanitarian ceasefire. Um, Adwan, um, 
Erdogan's real influence on the situation on the ground is probably rather limited. That's what analysts uh, have uh, said. Um, from the beginning of the crisis, you know, he has uh, tried to present himself as a mediator, some sort of peace broker, something that he has done in the Russia-Ukraine war. But when it comes to Israel and Hamas, we have not really seen any tangible results so far. The Turkish government, for example, in October has said that they are negotiating with Hamas for the release of uh, civilian hostages held by the militants, but we have not heard anything about that. Uh, is that making any effort? Is that making any progress? Uh, probably because other players in the region, uh, Iran, Qatar, Egypt, uh, are much more influential here. But uh, President Erdogan also talked about uh, some humanitarian efforts, efforts to get aid into uh, Gaza. He said that Turkey has sent hundreds of tons of uh, medical aid, for example, by cargo planes or ships to Egypt uh, to hopefully reach people inside uh, the besieged uh, Gaza Strip. That is something he's been uh, emphasizing over and over again here in Turkey as well. And away from uh, Israel, Hamas, on uh, his uh, little shopping list of uh, items to discuss, um, migration, uh, Turkish EU accession and visa liberalization. Yes, indeed. Um, and I think, I mean, the EU-Turkey um, session or Turkey's um, bid for EU membership and the accession talks, uh, they are de facto at a standstill at the moment. But visa liberalization is indeed a huge issue uh, for Turkey, for the Turkish government. Uh, it's something that's been a promise to Turkey um, within the framework of this uh, EU-Turkey uh, migration deal in 2016. Uh, but uh, it's not been granted uh, to Turkey. Turkey, and uh, we hear from many Turkish students, Turkish business people, that they have huge difficulties getting a visa uh, to travel uh, to, to Germany and other European countries. So that is something the Turkish government uh, is always bringing up in these uh, bilateral uh, talks. Uh, we also think that uh, Erdogan will bring up the issue of the Eurofighter jet planes. Uh, Simon has already talked about uh, that. And then, of course, uh, trade between the two countries, Germany is Turkey's or one of Turkey's most important trade partners. Trade volume between the two countries uh, was $45 billion last year. So uh, there are many, many important political and economic ties. So I think uh, neither Erdogan nor the German Chancellor, of course, have any interest in, in burning bridges there between the two countries over the Israel-Hamas war. And that is, I think, that became very, very clear today. Thank you for that, uh, Yulia. Yulia Hahn in Istanbul. You're watching uh, DW News live from Berlin. Special coverage of the uh, press conference uh, between the uh, German uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz and the Turkish uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan at the German Chancellery here in Berlin, which is where we find our chief political editor, Michaela Kufner. Welcome, Michaela. Uh, you'll doubtless have covered many visits like this. This one was expected to be an awkward one, was it? Yes, it was indeed. That was quite a press conference that we heard there. Clearly, the German Chancellor chose not to rise to the many, what would be definitely seen here as provocations. Um, essentially, President Erdogan doubling down on his criticism of Israel, avoiding the very controversial language that he used before, though. He, uh, just on the eve of this vis visit, had called Israel, quote, a terror terrorist state. Um, and he, in the past, uh, described Hamas as essentially uh, liberation fighters. Now, he didn't do that here under Olaf Scholz's own roof. That's something he would have definitely had to respond to. But he basically accused Israel it, uh, itself as holding, quote, hostages in the form of Palestinian prisoners. So very controversial, as expected, I dare say. At the same time, a German chancellor who chose not to even engage on that very controversial language that critically was very much criticized by the Jewish community here as well. Basically, the, the um, head of the Council of Jews here in Germany said that Turkey is not really a viable partner for Germany uh, when it uses this kind of rhetoric, also denying Israel's right to exist. 
asked about this, Erdogan didn't repeat this today. So one can say there was a certain amount of restraint on the Turkish side, but also demands that border on political blackmail. For instance, when Erdogan stresses the big role Turkey's had in the past on the grain shipment deal, grain being shipped out of Ukraine towards Africa. And here, very clearly for everyone to see, linking this, the success of this with um, the defense cooperation with Germany, not specifically mentioning those fighter planes that we expect him to request just behind me in those talks. Right. And from the German chancellor, how would you sum up his message? His message is we fundamentally disagree, but because we disagree, and he almost said this word by word, we need to talk to each other. And one thing is very clear, that both sides are intertwined, their societies are intertwined. There are some three million um, people in this country who have Turkish roots, one and a half million who are Turkish citizens. Um, at the same time, a lot of hopes rest on Turkey and um, Turkish President Erdogan was very blatant about this. He was very proud about this, uh, saying, look, we were the ones who were able to speak to both Ukraine and Russia, and we are the ones who are able to speak in the region and work towards uh, something of uh, a calming of the situation. That's something Olaf Scholz also stressed, that the one point where both sides do agree is that they want to prevent that conflict between Israel and Hamas from spreading further into the region. So those fundamental mental points they do have in common, although on every single detail almost except that, they fundamentally disagree. Well, it'd be good to be a fly on the wall when they actually uh, get to talking. For now, uh, DW's uh, chief political uh, editor, uh, Michaela Kufner, thank you so much.